studying the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, the Sermon on the Plain is Jesus' instruction to his disciples about how to live the Christian life. In fact, Jesus is discipling his disciples in the Sermon on the Plain. A number of weeks ago, we looked at how Jesus chose 12 disciples in chapter 6, and then immediately he launched into the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, these two passages are intricately connected because Jesus is teaching the disciples what it means to be a disciple, how he expects disciples to live, and by discipling his disciples, he's discipling us. And it's very interesting the things that Jesus focuses on. He doesn't focus on theology as important as theology is. He focuses on how disciples live in a fallen world. Theology is important, but theology doesn't make a person necessarily a strong Christian. Theology is only good as theology is lived out in daily practical living. And so Jesus is talking in this passage about what I've entitled, getting to the root of a critical spirit. And what we'll see as we read this passage, take it apart, study it together, it really does matter to Jesus that we not have a critical demeanor, a critical spirit, uh, a disposition that points out the, the small faults and, and uh, struggles that people have while never really seriously considering the sin in our own lives. Let me begin reading in verse 35 and read through verse 42. Jesus said, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil people. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now, he also spoke a parable to them. A person who is blind cannot guide another who is blind, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone when he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Uh, Jesus is giving down-to-earth instructions to the disciples, and He's given it to you and me through the writing of Luke. There are seven things I want you to notice this morning in this brief passage. The first one is this. Show God's love and mercy to people who frustrate you, rub you the wrong way, and who get under your skin. God put them in your life for your good. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that larger passage that began with the idea, love your enemies, and then it concluded with the idea there in verse 35, love your enemies. But I thought it was a good segue into the passage that followed, and it, and it reminded me it's a lot easier to say love your enemies than it is to actually love your enemies. It, it's easy for me to dismiss people who bother me, who frustrate me, uh, people who get under my skin, but I need to be reminded God put them in my life for a purpose. God put them in my life for a good purpose because I need to learn to love people that either don't live up to the standards that I think they ought to live up to, who don't do things the way that I would like them to do them, or whose personality and disposition just rub me the wrong way. Jesus says, love your enemies. And He says, when you do, you're storing up treasure in heaven. God is taking account. He's keeping a record. 
He's watching how we treat people that frustrate us, that, that, uh, that again, rub us the wrong way. And by His strength, for His glory, when we love them, we're storing up treasure for ourselves. But maybe even more important than that, we will be recognized as children of God because that's the way God treats us. Can you imagine how much you must get under God's skin? How much you must frustrate Him? And yet He's kind and good and caring toward us. Uh, Think about the fact of evil people who don't do His will. It says in Matthew's gospel, He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. It says here, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil people. So when we are kind to people who bother us, who stress us out, who try our patience, we're just being like God. And the more like God we are, the more patient we will be. The more like God we are, the more kind we will be. The more like God we are, the more we will love people that our flesh does not want to love. And we need to be reminded, He brought them into our lives. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, and we do, God placed them in our lives. They work at the desk next to us at the office because God gave them that desk. God put them over us as our supervisor so that God could use them in our lives to help us love people that frustrate us. And so we can be like Him because we definitely frustrate Him. And He is kind to ungrateful and evil people. How much more should we be kind to them? He says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So to love people is to be merciful toward them. Uh, Give them slack. Be forbearing, kind, generous, and caring toward them. And so he begins with this idea that we need to love people because when we love people like God loves people, we are a light in a dark world because there is in our culture now the message, you hate people who aren't like you. You hate people who oppose you. You hate people who are different than you. But that's not the message of discipleship that Jesus is teaching. Secondly, I want you to notice that Jesus says, do not be judgmental. And by that, I think he means unnecessarily critical. He gives a command and he gives a promise. Look again in verse 37 and 30. He says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Now, it's important to know what Jesus doesn't mean when he says, do not judge, as important as it is to know what he does mean when he says, do not judge. Because that command, do not judge, is the world's favorite command of Jesus. They will disregard everything else Jesus says, but they will hold tenaciously to that idea, do not judge. And so when the Christian stands up for the rights of an unborn baby, they will say, you are being judgmental. Jesus says, do not judge. I had that discussion numerous times with my family when they were alive. And we would get on the, they would bring up the issue of abortion. I would speak strongly against abortion. I would say that every, every life beginning at conception is important to God. And they would say, you are being judgmental. And I would say, I've heard that before. Can you find it for me in the Bible? Well, they, they, they'd heard it said they couldn't find it in the Bible if their life had depended upon it. Let's just think about what Jesus said in some other context for just a moment. Jesus said in some one context in Matthew chapter 7 that false teachers are like wolves in sheep's clothing. In the world's eyes, that sounds very judgmental. But whatever it is, it doesn't contradict what Jesus taught when he says, do not judge He's not saying that we're not to make moral distinctions. He's not saying we're not to make theological distinctions. Uh, That's insanity. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, 
verses 1 through 6, which is the parallel passage to what we're reading and studying this morning, Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine. He says, some people are like spiritual pigs. That sounds kind of judgmental. All he's saying is they can't appreciate the glory of the gospel. They can't appreciate the truths of Scripture. Uh, they, will, they, will, they will turn on it. They will demolish it. Jesus said about the religious hypocrites, they're like whitewashed tombs. And everybody that comes in contact with them is, are going to be defiled. So when Jesus says, do not judge, he's not saying we shouldn't take a stand for truth and error, for that which is right over against that which is wrong. But what he is talking about is being unnecessarily critical. And that's something that I think most of us probably struggle with. Having a particular jaundiced eye toward particular people. The very people that we're told to love in the previous two verses, we are told now to not be in judgment over them and not to be unnecessarily critical toward them. I thought a lot about this idea of a critical spirit this week. There's a number of things I want to say to you about it. The first one is this, a critical spirit destroys relationships. It can kill a marriage. It can do serious, irreversible damage to a parent-child relationship. It can cause a toxic work environment. It can kill a marriage. And that doesn't please God. It destroys the relationship between a parent and a child, and that is displeasing to God. It can cause a toxic, unhealthy work environment. And so, a critical spirit is much more damaging than we might ever believe. It's easy to preach against drugs and pornography and promiscuity, it's another thing for us to look seriously at our lives and to try and discern, do I have a critical spirit? A critical spirit is not Christ-like, it's antichrist-like. It's the very opposite of what Jesus is demonstrating for us here. Jesus is telling us not to be nitpicky, hypersensitive, critical, and fault-finding. Looking at the speck and saying, you know, I don't like that speck, whatever that speck may be. It may be that your spouse doesn't do things the way that you would want them done. And so you criticize them for it. And maybe a coworker carries out a task differently than you would want it done. So you criticize them for it. It's an unchristlike demeanor toward people. If Jesus had a critical spirit, he would be frustrated with us all of the time because we never measure up perfectly to the standards that he has laid down for us. But he understands we're children, we're growing, we're maturing, and we need to give people room to mature and grow as well. A critical, a critical spirit is self-confidence, hiding an insatiable desire to be in control. A critical spirit is self-confidence, hiding an insatiable desire to be in control. Some people just have to be in control. They've got to be in control of everything and everyone. And they present themselves as just being omnicompetent or self-confident, but really it's an insatiable longing to control you, to control me, to control all of the circumstances of their lives and the lives of others. I had someone come to me after the, after the first service and said, you, you won't believe this. I, I went to a, a person this week and I said, pray for me. I have a critical spirit and I, I don't know why. 
And they, they said to me, when I heard that control and self-confidence are intricately related to a critical spirit, I knew immediately where my critical spirit was coming from. It came from an insatiable desire to be in control because I feel omnicompetent. And so, a critical spirit is often hidden deep beneath the surface. A critical spirit criticizes and tears down more than it praises and builds up. And that's a lazy person. Well, you may say, well, I, I work from, from sunrise to sunset. There's nothing lazy about me. You're lazy if you criticize more than you praise. You're, ra- you're lazy if you tear down more than you build up because it's easy to tear down and build, uh, than, it's easier to tear down than it is to build up. It's easier to criticize than to praise. It, it's easier to pick out the faults and highlight those than it is to look for every possible opportunity to build a person up, to praise a person, to encourage a person, to speak a good word to a person about what they've done, even if it's not all that you thought that it ought to be, you never accomplish everything the way God wants you to accomplish it, nor do I. It's a lazy approach to living. It's detrimental. It's detrimental to you and to the people that you work with, the people that you live with, the people that you worship with. If you're coming to someone's mind right now, you probably have a critical spirit. If you're wondering if you're coming to someone's mind right now and and you're thinking of a person, you probably have a critical spirit. We earn the reputation of a critical spirit the old-fashioned way. We, We work for it. It's a narcissistic approach to life. It's a me-centered approach to life. It's a self-assertive, self-righteous approach to life. And narcissism manifests itself in one way through a critical, demeaning depreciation of others and a a magniable attempt to try and control the world that you live in and the world of others. I want you to notice with me in verse 38 a a third idea. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. You've heard me say that many, many times. You see where it comes from in verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. What you give, you get back. Only it's going to come more. It's going to come fuller. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And so, we reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow. We reap later than we sow. And sometimes when the harvest comes, it's too late to do anything about it. Sometimes when the harvest is reaped, things have just deteriorated too far. A miracle is possible, but it might not be probable. A demeaning, depreciatory relationship with your spouse, multiplied by many years, eventually kills a marriage. Sometimes people just live together in separate lives. Sometimes they divorce. By the time the spouse who has done that discovers that, it may very well be too late, apart from a miracle of God. And so, we reap what we sow, but it comes back to us like a tidal wave, like a tsunami, like a, like a large wave. Uh, Jesus isn't de- dealing in the ethereal here. He's dealing in the practical. He's dealing with where you and I live on a daily basis. And so, in light of that, Jesus says, choose your teachers and models wisely because you may end up in the ditch of negativity. Notice what he says in verses 39 and 40. 
Now he also spoke a parable to them. A person who is blind cannot guide another who is blind, can he? You see, narcissism blinds us to our weaknesses. Self-righteousness causes us not to be able to see that our self-confidence is really a cover for a critical disposition. It blinds us. A blind discipler can't lead a blind disciple well because they'll both fall into a pit. What's the pit? The pit is unnecessary, hypercritical spirit. A student is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. That's why you want to model yourself after people you can see on a regular basis. That is, with the catastrophic failures in a lot of uh, large evangelical churches in recent years, we, we watch these people on the screen from a distance, but we don't see their depreciatory spirit toward those who work with them and those who work for them. And then all of a sudden, we're just caught completely off guard, whether it's this church or that church, about this person's fall, and we discover that a part of the reason that their ministry collapsed was they just didn't treat people kindly. They didn't treat people well. They didn't love people the way that Jesus wanted them to love people. And so we want to follow good examples, people in our Bible fellowship groups, people in our Wednesday night discipleship groups, people that we set beside in choir, people that we get to know up close and personal. Jesus wants us to be a model, and He wants us to be a model particularly for others, particularly those who are younger than us spiritually. You can learn a lot just by observation and by a listening ear. So we want to choose our teachers and models wisely. I want you to notice, sixthly, keep an eye on your eye and give an ear to your words. Keep an eye on your eye and give an ear to your words. Look at verse 41 and verse 42 with me. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? I. And you can sense how you read that has a little bit of how you interpret it. it. You could probably read it like this. Why do you look at the speck in someone else's eye and don't notice the massive log that is in your own eye? And so keep an eye on how you look at people who rub you the wrong way and don't live up to your standards. Keep an eye on that because it says more about you than it does about them. And then he says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the long that is in your own eye? you hypocrite. Now, he's going to tell us that we do have responsibility to our brothers and sisters, brothers with brothers and sisters with sisters, men with men and ladies with ladies. It's not that we don't try to help them and serve them and minister to them in their weaknesses and even talk with them and pray with them and, and, uh, and encourage them in their weaknesses. But not until there's been a period of serious self-examination, particularly in the area that we're about to talk to them about. That we need to be praying for them before we talk to them. We need to be looking at ourselves before we talk to them. We need to go to them humbly and lovingly and caringly before we talk to them. It's not that we're not to talk to them, but sometimes we talk way too much and we talk way too quickly. Sometimes our prayer about the speck in our brother or sister's eye, they may see themselves before we ever have to say anything to them about it. Uh, But keep an eye on your eye and give an ear to your words. What are you looking at and how are you talking? The seventh thought is this. What can we do to kill 
a critical spirit. Don't fret. There is hope for those of us with this sinful disease. Most of us have it to some degree, just, just admit it. How do you determine if you have a critical spirit? If you're married, ask your spouse. And unless they're afraid of you, they will honestly answer you. If you're concerned about it, ask your children. Unless they're afraid of you, they will honestly answer you. If you wonder about it, ask those that you work closely with, particularly those that rub you the wrong way. And if they're willing to be honest with you, then they may very well affirm or deny that you have a critical spirit. But the people closest to us, if we're married, if we have children, work, well, there's plenty of opportunities for us to be demeaning, depreciative, and critical of other people. The only thing that's going to motivate us to, to attack it is a love for Jesus. You don't love Jesus if you know you have a critical spirit. You don't love him enough. If you know you have a critical spirit, you're not going to do anything about it. But the more you love him, the more you're going to desire to attack it. It spreads like a weed. It infects relationships. So it's not easy to get it out by the roots, but you have to start somewhere. And so you start by trying to discern, do I have a critical spirit? Do I, do I live a lazy life? Do I praise more? or critique more. And then you confess it to the Lord. You confess that Jesus says, do not judge. Quit maximizing. I've been maximizing the speck in other people's eyes. I've not been noticing or even caring about seriously confronting the log in my own eye. That is sin. Lord, I confess it to you. And then go on a Criticism fast. A fast where you don't critique other people unless it is absolutely essential. Unless it is absolutely important. And so you're going to critique fast. But all of that sounds so much self-effort. Is, is, is Jesus expect me to do it in my own strength? Absolutely not. He not only tells us what to do, he's going to empower us to do it. That's the great thing about Jesus. He doesn't just say, do this. He gives us the strength, the power to do it. Even when we don't have the desire to do it, he gives us the strength and the power to do it. In Ephesians 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another, and that's how criticism usually is expressed, it begins in the mind, but it always, almost always finds expression through the lips. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, that doesn't mean that we go around singing to one another. That's the last thing you would want me to do is to sing to you, or most of you don't want me to even sing with you. But the point is, our speech is saturated with encouragement and edification and love and nurture and hope. We might wonder, I don't know if I can do that. I have it so ingrained in me. I have such a jaundiced eye toward my wife. God can do what you don't want to do if you will do what he empowers you to do. See, it doesn't matter if you want to do it or not. If you will just do it, he'll give you the strength to do it. You might say, well, I'm not going to do it unless he gives me the strength to do it. He doesn't give you the strength to do it until you're doing it. And so pray for the Spirit's empowerment. And then see it as going, going to war. You're, you're going on a war, to war with a sin that God hates that you and I have been complicit to, that you and I have lived with, with pe in peaceful coexistence. We've lived in peaceful coexistence with this critical demeanor. We've allowed it to exist. We've allowed it to grow. We've allowed it to multiply because a narcissistic mindset is never just satisfied with controlling a few lives. They want to control every life. And so 
you have to see it as going to war. I'm going to go to war against this because my marriage is in danger, my, my parenting is in danger, my work, professional life is in danger, because a critical spirit bleeds over. It spreads like a weed, and it's never self-contained. So you're fighting to save your marriage. You're fighting to keep your relationship with your children healthy and holy. You're fighting so that the, re- the work environment is not toxic, but you are a light maybe in the midst of a dark workplace. And it's hard to be a witness and a light if you're a complainer. Negative, critical, nitpicky, and fault-finding. It's hard to be a light. Nobody listens to that kind of testimony from a person who lives that way. And so you just make the determination, I'm going to war with it. I'm going to fight it by God's grace, for God's glory, and the strength that God provides. I am going to root out every vestige of, of criticism and nitpickiness in my, in my life. And what you'll find, the beauty is you'll be a happier person. You'll be a more joyful person. Nothing steals joy or makes one have a dour spirit, whether at home or on the job, than a critical spirit. If you're unhappy in your home, there's a critical spirit. I'm not saying it's necessarily yours. If you're unhappy at work, it's probably your critical spirit that is causing you to be unhappy. The fullness of the Spirit, the be filled with the Spirit. The very first one is love, and the second is joy. Critical Spirit steals the joy of living. It causes a dark shadow to to cover virtually everything that we're involved in and everything that we do. So it's worth fighting on, for several reasons. First is for God's glory, second for your good, third for the good of those around you, be it your marriage, your parenting, or your, or your, work, your workplace. So what I'm, I'm calling you to this morning is to warfare, to a war against a critical spirit that will be for your good and God's glory. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then Aaron Pickard is going to come, and we'll stand together and and sing. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we recognize that uh, this insidious sin is a quiet killer. And Father, we understand what do not judge does not mean. Help us to understand what it does mean. And Father, for some of us, there's just all kinds of emotions running through us right now, and it's very likely that that is an evidence that in some place, in some role, in some fashion, there's a jaundiced eye and an unkind word. Help us keep an eye on our eye and give an ear to our words. Not so much first and foremost for us or even for others, but for your glory because of who you've called us to be, because of the example that you have set before us so that we might be recognized as sons and daughters of God so that we might store up treasure in heaven rather than treasure on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.